We have made it to the last double digit ramble of all time. Pretty crazy, 99 total rambles and I've been doing them for about just under two years I'd like to say. Got a few things to cover as always today and the first thing I actually wanted to bring up was this post from Yoda's Yoda on Twitter this morning. He basically tweeted out, I would love to know your opinions on the best Greyhelm accounts in the game. Tried to come up with a list of three but could not settle on anything below five so he listed five. He said Iron Higer, Tails, Dear Deer, Bamf, and Say Aloe. And then he's asking the community, who are the absolute best irons for you? I would like to know who you guys think are the best gray helms in the game. And I think we could kind of uh, add on to this UIM's group. Well, there's no group Iron Man. <laughs> That's the goat. I mean, I guess Alfie Max really fast. It's impressive. But honestly, so I tweeted out. Iron Higer is the greatest Iron Man of all time. There is a debate, clearly. You know, some people just don't care about skilling as much. So that, in turn, could just lead somebody to believe that that's just not the best Iron. But Iron Higer is a fucking king at this game. He was the first to max on dead man mode, for those that didn't even know that. He plays almost every single mode that comes out, dominates, and he's also rank one Iron Man in the entire game. Just a few months ago, he literally did a 50 mil agility month through Sepulchre. I mean, 50 fucking mil agility XP in a month. Like, how? <laughs> I could just go on about all the achievements he's completed. But, I mean, he not only is a skiller and is competing to be the rank one Iron Man in the game, but he's also completed quite a lot. He basically has done clue scrolls. He's done a lot of bosses. He's obviously completed the Inferno. I'm not exactly sure how many CAs he's completed, but I admire his dedication to go for rank one Iron Man because it would be so easy right now to just give up on that and just be like, oh, let's just go on collection log. Let's start doing things a little bit more macro. But he still dedicates himself to becoming the rank one. Without a doubt in my mind, he I know he will continue to do collection log stuff in the future because he's just a fucking gamer. It's just natural gamer. Total beast. I'd love to hear what you guys had to say. There were some other honorable mentions. I'm not going to go into all of them, but if you guys would like to just read them real quick. I really love these kind of questions. Uh, I'm not going to unmute that. Oh, God. I have some people muted. No offense to anybody that's muted, but I really appreciate all the kind words and feedback on the Bodhi Save A cast. It was uh, really a treat to hear some of your guys' compliments. So thank you very much. And yeah, it was just fantastic. I loved talking to him. It was it went better than I expected. I got pretty nervous. I mean, talking to the king of old school RuneScape content creation for the first time ever is pretty intimidating. It lasted a long time. A lot of people wanted them long. Uh, there's people on Reddit that think, you know, they should be no longer than 30 minutes so that, you know, they can... They just want a TLDR for everything, you know? So it was fantastic. The next cast, I am planning on getting Kemp Q on on June 1st. So it will have been about two weeks. I was planning on getting uh, some guests on. Well, one episode in particular that just hasn't really been confirmed right now. So still is a little bit of time. There's like, if, if it doesn't happen in the next day though, I doubt that we'll even have a cast this week. But next Wednesday, Kemp Q will be on. And I'm really excited about it. By the way, I don't know if you guys have checked out RuneScape Chronicles, his uh, new series. It's kind of like Behemoth. Not to take away anything from behemoth but behemoth you know has his style pretty long generally just takes the clips and commentates over them it's pretty similar but chem q adds such good editing to it and he makes it flow real nicely the pacing is fucking on point it's impressive it's very impressive it's called runescape chronicles i'll have it linked down in the description if you guys want to check it out he just I think, I don't know how often he uploads it. It appears as though he's doing it like every day or every other day, but just fantastic. He just pulls like the top maybe 10 clips and just has some great narration in it. And it's just fantastic. So go show him some support there. Honestly, if you guys are loving Behemoth, you would love this as well. Pro maybe more. I, again, not to take anything away from Behemoth. Behemoth is obviously the OG, in my opinion. But Kemp Q is taking another twist on it, which is really cool. I'll have that down in the description if you want to just want to check it out. Uh, but yeah, I'll have some topics once I post the announcement tweet. Go follow me on Twitter down in the description as well. People have been asking me, when are you going to talk about the Raids 3 
reworks. So, or not, not well, I guess it's kind of reworks, but they're getting pulled. And um, I want to just pull it up right here, actually. So, Tombs of a Masket reward changes. The only things I really want to talk about are the Shadow of Tumakin, which used to be the Hecka of Tumakin, which is a two tick wand that variated. Variated? Is that even a word? That varied. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That varied from a two tick attack every three attacks into a four for a bigger t um, attack. It was really fucking confusing. And the thing that made it most confusing is how the damage multipliers worked and the different effects being on different spell books. It was a shit show. I swear to God, I should be one of those people that's super up to date with, you know, items coming out. I had no idea what that wand was about. I knew it was good and I wanted it, but I didn't really know why I wanted it. Probably just because I don't have a Sanguinesti. Anyway, they have replaced that new Hecka that they have been proposing for months to a Shadow of Tumakin, which honestly feels good. It feels standardized. Raids 1, Tebow, 5 tick, 1 handed, beast, niche as well. TOB, niche, 5 tick, 2 handed, beast weapon that is niche it's only good against big monsters you know and now we have the shadow of tumakin again five tick two-handed very niche powerful as fuck so the thing that makes this thing powerful though is when you are wearing max mage and the best part about it and i was watching no monkeys by the way no i got to give a shout out to no monkey i just started watching his content fantastic youtuber total beast at the game super well-made videos i look at my own videos when i watch these like actually good youtubers i'm like jesus christ i gotta like start upping things up because mine are just so shit in comparison anyway basically how this works is it triples whatever your magic accuracy and damages i believe i believe that's how it kind of works and basically when you're in a room such as nilo for example a lot of people in nilo will just bring one sanx which may be an occult using the shadow in an occult like a two-way mage switch would render this staff completely useless i mean it would be total garbage the cool thing about this is it does have a place so in those situations where you just want to do like a really minimal switch over to your mage gear like a three or four way switch this actually wouldn't be best this only really excels when you have absolute max mage and the other thing that's really cool about that is it gives reason to use for example the seer's ring or eternal boots things like that that generally don't really have a use i mean yeah they're best in slots but it's just accuracy now it's a huge deal because it's being tripled so that's really fucking cool i'm actually just gonna have no monkeys guide linked or not guide his little video he talks about it a lot more and he goes into where it's good on the bosses a lot of this information can already just be found here on the blog but i'm just gonna shout out no monkey because his video was fantastic and he explains it very precisely and clearly so that a lot of people can understand so i'll have that video linked down in the description as well so you guys can if you guys are interested more in the shadow of tumakin that's awesome okay the other thing that they changed oh so here's the numbers by the way so the green means that it's now best commander ziliana this is actually better than a fucking tebow which is crazy criara your defense is going to be absolute garbage wearing full ancestral but look at that 6.8 versus 6.2 with chinchampas abyssal portal which is vespula by the way first i was thinking that was like abyssal sire portal phase or <laughs> i don't even know calfi queen this is actually just disgusting now and of course krill they're actually making mage good which is really cool now the other thing they've changed is osmumpton's fang osmumpton fang now has different stats they've lowered the accuracy dramatically and they've lowered the strength a good bit but it still has a place because now what happens is if the first roll misses a second roll occurs which is unique to any melee weapon i mean this is completely unique it rolls two hits so if you miss the first one it would just re-roll it you could still miss the second one but there's a very high likelihood that you're gonna be hitting non-stop this thing's gonna be absolutely disgusting on necks 100 now i'm not exactly sure i believe it's actually worse at corp which kind of is making me just want to go back to corp now and go hunt the ellie well i still want to get the giant squirrel still want to get my torva blade body but honestly, I mean, we could start on the Ellie grind. Uh, I know Raids 3 will be out, so maybe I'll just kind of wait until Raids 3 has been released and kind of given some time and I'll go back to Corp. Because, I mean, the only thing that's really an upgrade to Corp now is just Masori for Mage Defense, but that's not even that essential. Kind of cool. This will have a place. I'm not exactly sure. I'd love to hear what you guys have to say in the comments, but I don't think it's going to be good at Corp. As It might be good at Corp if you're not specking it down. So, like, if you're doing, like, some main metas. But for Iron Man metas, no you're not going to be using this they're also coming with out with the four 
rune pouch rune pouch the four slot rune pouch there we go that sounds better kind of cool it's people think it's underwhelming some people think oh no it's like really good you just gotta see where it's good for but I mean, it is just a slight upgrade. It's one inventory slot you're saving, which, you know, you could argue is massive, but I would just say, eh, it's whatever. A lot of the time, you're not even going to be using four runes anyway, but in those times, you will be saving an inventory spot, which is pretty cool. It might be good for things like raids, where inventory is very, very tight. I generally think of things like Seractus, where it's like, oh, I'm just not bringing an extra food. That's no big deal. I'm a huge fan of the Shadow of Tumakin. I think it's cool. I'm a little sad that the two tick ones are coming out, but it was so fucking confusing. I think everyone's just on board with this new beast staff that's two-handed. Some people were saying, oh, the Ward of Elodinus is completely useless now. It's not useless. It just has limited uses now. And the biggest use now for the Ward of Elodinus, which is the arcane attachment, is just barraging. I mean, using any ancient spells, that is going to be just dominant. So Slayer, PKing, I guess, is going to be huge. It's not going to be able to be worked with the Shadow, which is totally fine. By the way, I want to quickly shout out the Saze Bays. Thank you guys for supporting my channel. If we get to 50 members, I will upload all previous and future rambles onto Spotify and other popular podcasting platforms. So big shout out to Womble, Jack, Shrek, Sean P, NM, Bobby Hill, Colin and Skilled Kill. Much love, guys. Thank you very much for the support. It really means a lot, and I'm just glad to have you as members. If you guys would like to join the Saze Bays, you can click the join button. I've been doing Sepulchre for the past couple weeks, and we have already green logged it. I've got, I wish this would just stack. So apparently, stackables do go up to like 65,000, unless they're untradeable. So all untradeables, if they are stackable or not stackable, just go to 250. I believe that's how it works. Four rings, you guys probably saw that instantaneously. Yes, I am absolutely spoon fed under a one in a hundred. This is these are one in two hundred. I have four and under four hundred, which is pretty fucking gross. Now they don't really have much use for me. I still have them in my sepulcher thing, so I have like the regular ring of durance. It's on me right now. And then three right here. I doubt that there will ever be a reason to use Rings of Endurance in the future, like duplicates. Maybe you could trade them in for like a thousand amulets. I mean, I'm not even kidding. For something that low, I'd probably probably still fucking do it because I'm just I want stamps. But I'll probably just drop them over for some money and uh, give it away for the Sebe Award ceremony at the end of the year on my stream. I generally do some fun giveaways and stuff. So just some money to throw away at the end of the year. Yeah, I don't think there will ever be a way to like dissolve them into something useful oh i don't know if you guys noticed but i actually changed my tile marker colors you guys have been watching the sepulcher in the background i'm actually crafting right now but i decided to record something a little bit more interesting yes i fuck up a lot in sepulcher i'm still learning i expect to get pretty good at around a thousand laps that's what i'm giving myself i'm giving myself a big window to like improve work on things that i'm bad at uh try to be more precise in my clicks when i started learning sepulcher i just always looked at the arrows i never looked at the floor so yellow and blues i didn't care about if i got pushed ahead if i got pushed back it didn't really matter now i'm trying to relearn that i'm trying to look at the floor and then every few ticks look at what the next arrows are showing so i just glance real quickly and then go back to the floors and start looking now of course you can always just get fucked over because yellows can just spawn underneath you and just teleport you backward without you having any chance so a lot of it is rng but there are still looking out for blues prepare for them going out of your way to hit a blue dodging yellows purposefully there is skill involved and i'm trying to learn that and i make a lot of mistakes so hopefully within the next 600 ish runs i'll get a lot more proficient people have been asking when will you make a sepulcher guide my sepulcher guide will be more based on like clue scrolls it's not going to be oh here's the best way to do it when all the floors are static i've been doing a lot of floors on public worlds where there's like people there and a lot of the floors just start non-static, which means it's a lot easier to make a guide of Sepulcher when you just assume all floors are static because everything's the exact same every time you enter. I'm not going to be making any efficient guide per se right as of right now, but I do want to talk a little bit about the clue rates and what's kind of worth it. Worth is very subjective, of course, but I'll go into it. I tweeted my proposals for Hallowed Sepulchre. It didn't get much um, attention. It got 40 likes. And, you know, a lot of people, whenever they see anything that I suggest, it's just like, oh, you want the game easier for yourself, you fucking bitch. Yeah, I mean, that's 
part of the reason why I'm proposing things because I would firsthand benefit from it and I think it would be a good thing. I'm not trying to bring out an update that's just completely fucking busted saying give me an elite clue every minute or else. I just think that this would help incentivize looting the lower floors. The argument is like why buff the rates but I mean who's to say that these rates are what they should be. I mean everything's subjective at the end of the day. My buffs weren't that crazy anyway. It's assuming a lot so what I posted here is kind of what I posted on my last ramble which is basically right now you know there's one chest on floor one to loot one chest on floor two two chests on floor three and four and three chests on floor five with the grand chest at the very end and here's the rates currently and here are my proposed rates I already talked about this so I'm not going to go into it much but this was very interesting I asked API dev to calc this for me he's a fucking legend in a thousand runs if you were to loot every single coffin which is unrealistic I mean it is realistic if that's really what you wanted to do it's tough and you're XP rates would be total trash. And I didn't mention this because I would be projecting basically, but I want people to just understand that when you're looting more, you're not getting 90K agility XP an hour. I mean, right now I'm looting floors three, four, and five on average, and I'm just getting over 70K agility XP an hour. Now, yeah, the loot's insane. Sepulchre's busted, don't get me wrong. When you start adding more incentive to loot the lower floors, your agility rates are going way down. So sometimes the argument is Sepulchre's already so good, don't give it more, but you're detracting, you know, the XP by giving a little bit more. So these buffs are not like absolutely fucking out of control. They're just giving a little bit more incentive to loot the lower floors. Now, yes, the elites and the hards were buffed slightly. That was mainly just to standardize the numbers for 110, 1 in 25, and 1 in 50. Now, I also mentioned a few things at the bottom, which you obviously can't see right now. So let me go here. There we go. So I said toward the bottom about sepulcher instances. Now, you know what's really funny? I got a comment. You know what? Let's just fucking show it. Who is the guy that commented? Can be paid through deaths. Like I mentioned something about like having instances and having to pay 20 mil for it. And then I just mentioned, yeah, it could be paid through death's coffer. And the guy is like absolutely shameless. Just wants content buff for himself because he put a lot of money into his death coffer. Like, I don't even think I've ever met this guy in my life. Just like straight up just throwing shit down on Twitter. That just makes no sense. And in fact, I'm probably one of the only, I'm probably like one of the few Iron Men where this argument just doesn't work because I am probably one of 10 Iron Men in the entire fucking game that actually purchased 888 mil of raw GP to buy 1200 bank slots. Trust me, I'm not fucking struggling with GP. We could just remove the Death's Coffer thing. I just feel like Death's Coffer is a good place for it because it's an item sink as well as a gold sink. Little irritated. Now, this is just, you know, what you have to deal with when you put up community posts. I understand why people get upset. Yes. I'm known as I like clue scrolls. Yes, I'm known as if there's something I want in the game, I'm going to announce it. They will just start flaming people for suggesting anything. It's really sad. It's like it just stifles creativity. Now, I'm not saying, oh, my thing is so creative. But when people have suggestions for the game, just give some good, solid feedback. And that's it. You don't need to like start projecting and be like, oh, you just want this because of this. Like, just just take it like just take a step back, evaluate what I'm trying to propose or what anybody would be trying to propose but you bring up things like this and like people just get really buttered by the way this whole instance thing fine don't fucking bring instances out i brought this up because people want it now of course it would be nice but i am trust me i'm not the fucking forefront of sepulcher instances that is what the large majority of the community want especially people going for 200 mil agility i added it in there because i think it's fair to have a gp sync come into the game and remove frustration from people. People don't like having worlds started for them. And that's pretty much why I brought it up there. I also suggested a mode called friend mode, which if you guys know about next, you can like be in a friends chat together and you could set up a private instance and your whole team goes on there. So my idea for friend mode was as long as you're in a friends chat, you can all enter and you will guarantee have the exact same route as all the other people in the friends chat and you can race each other. So if you start floors at the same time, it's not going to create random fucking instances. By the way, that is a thing. So on a public world, you're all in the same world. There's four of you at the end of floor four. If you all enter floor five around the exact same time, so within uh, a few ticks margin, you will all create your own individual instances, which is really silly because there's an argument 
against allowing instances. There already are instances. They're just created randomly. I mean, it's really fucking silly. So I think it would be cool. Give a GP sync. Death's Coffer is just kind of to give the item sync because the Death's Coffer is an item sync uh, because people shove their items in there. They get deleted, turn into gold. Yeah, anyway, I just thought it would be cool to have a little bit of that and uh, allow people to have personal instances, allow people that want to race to have friend mode and you can just race each other. I've really enjoyed that. And then on public floors, please remove the randomly created instances. And then, of course, I mentioned at the end with question marks, because, you know, if I t if I put a period at the end, people would start having fucking meltdown about me wanting more clue scrolls. But I did it as a suggestion. I said hallowed marks and sacks. Basically, how the hallowed sacks work is it costs 100 hallowed marks and you buy a randomly rolled, rolled loot table, which comes from the floors directly. The floors now offer clue scrolls, but the sacks were never updated to give clue scrolls. So I just mentioned, hey, should we put clue scrolls on the hallowed sack table? And then I also suggested what if hallowed marks could purchase clue scrolls directly. And there was some negative feedback about that, which is totally fine. A lot of these are su are just suggestions and I love to hear what people have to say. I just figured I'd do my part in saying, you know, how I feel about Sepulchre. I don't know. Like, you know, you'll go three hours dry without getting a clue scroll. And that just feels a little bad. Uh, it just takes, I mean, it takes about four hours to get a hard clue there. It takes about two hours to get an elite. It takes about two hours if you're looting floor three to get a medium. Not to mention it takes about seven hours. If you have 92 agility, and you're doing the whole thing. I mean, it would take around seven to eight hours to get an easy clue. I just feel like they could have buffed it slightly and it wasn't dramatically increasing the elite clues. It was simply just to give more reason to loot the lower floors. So that's pretty much all I really wanted to talk about today. Let me know what you guys are up to in game. I asked a few questions toward the beginning parts of the rambles. So if you guys have any questions, leave them down in the comments. I read every single comment. Anyway, thank you guys for listening. Look forward to ramble 100. Thank you guys so much. Be sure to leave a subscription and a like and a comment down below. Follow me on uh, Twitch and Twitter down in the description as well. And I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.